Hello and welcome to season two of Planet Outlook Conversations. My guest this week is wildlife conservationist Gopa Kumar Menon, founder of River Otter Conservancy. He's also the member of the Otter Specialist Group of the IUCN, and he's also the alumnus of IIM Bangalore. Welcome, Gopa, to Planet Outlook. Thank you so much, Anandar. Looking forward. So, Gopa, why otters? Why not tigers? What? Why not elephants? Uh, what and uh, or or lions? What led you to work on otters? Which, if I use the word, a less charismatic species. Yeah. So, in a um, in a nutshell, you know, it is a very in its own way, it's a very beautiful and charismatic animal. Um, and when when I started volunteering in conservation, it was working with a couple of NGOs that were fairly established and so on. But over the years, uh, uh, we started, a couple of friends and I, we started looking at the lesser known species, primarily because they were so much out of the limelight. And then uh, quite fortuitously, I stumbled on an article which talked about um, the, the, the whole issue of trade in pelt and, uh, you know, about tiger skins and leopard skins and then otter skins being used uh, or being employed as a, a, a part of wildlife trade. And that got me really interested because it was an animal I always loved. Um, and then the more we studied it, the more there was cause for concern. Uh, in fact, at that time, the data suggested about eight years ago that for every leopard skin or, uh, that was... Um, available in the market, they were an estimated 50 to 75 water skins. We now know that a number of those skins were probably fake. But at that time, obviously, I didn't know that. And I still say probably, but that issue really got me uh, quite um, interested in conservation and in the species. So that's the answer really to your question. <laughs> So, and it's a lovely animal. It's a yeah, beautiful animal. But I, I guess a large uh, sections of the urban populace have never seen an otter, mm -hmm. or will not see an otter. So just just give us a, a brief natural history of otters and how many species of otters are there in the country. Yes. Yeah, so even before we talk about India, there are thirteen species worldwide, and I will mention that twelve out of those thirteen species are in decline as far as population is concerned, the overall wor worldwide population. In India, we find three species, uh, two species about which we know much more than the third. So the first species is really the, uh, the what is called the smooth coated otter. And that's the one that's more visible, so to speak. Uh, and all otters really are, they are part of river and stream ecosystems. Um, water essentially. And the second otter is the small clawed otter, also called the short clawed otter. And that is very difficult to spot uh, primarily because it's uh, largely nocturnal or what they call crepuscular, which means active in dawn and dusk. And that's found along the Western Ghats and you know a few other parts of India, uh, particularly in the upper reaches of streams and rivers. Uh, and they uh, actually eat and hunt uh, crustaceans and mollusks, crabs, snails, that sort of thing. Whereas the smooth coated otter about which I just told you, they are primarily fish eaters. And then there is a third species about which we are actually just learning. Earlier, we knew it was restricted. We thought it was restricted to the Himalayas uh, and the Eastern Himalayas and the Western Himalayas. But now there are very interesting reports of uh, the presence of this species, which is the Eurasian otter, uh, being uh, given from different parts of India, including central India, for example. Typical example is uh, Chilka Lake, where there have been uh, sightings of this otter. A lot more needs to be done to understand more about the ecology, behavior, various other things about this otter, the Eurasian otter. Uh, just to complete that in a moment, Ananda, um, our work has primarily focused on the smooth coated otter and the small clawed otter in that order. Yeah. Okay. And you work uh, especially in the Kaveri uh, basin, the Kaveri river. So tell us about that landscape a bit and uh, 
people who haven't seen uh, the Kaveri and that landscape, if you can describe a bit then. Definitely. So, uh, first of all, even within the Kaveri, we work within Karnataka. And uh, uh, we work in two landscapes along this beautiful river. So, all of us know that Kaveri is a very important river um, as far as water supply is concerned, both for agriculture and for cities that are today, you know, among the fastest growing in the country. Uh, there are two parts to this river, really, from our perspective. One is where the river originates the highlands or what we call the headwaters of the river, which is really in Kodugu or Kurg district. And 70% of um, all the water that is stored in the KRS dam, which uh, is this sort of iconic dam that was built um, 70 years ago, 70% uh, of that water is really from Kodugu district. And in the Kodugu district, we have the small clawed otter primarily in the headwaters, we also have the smooth coated otter in the same river. And there is a small little zone or a stretch of river where they overlap, actually, their distribution overlaps. Downstream of Mysore, we work in a sort of 40 kilometer stretch of the river, which is very agriculture centric on both sides before, and then it goes into what is called the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. Um, there, there are a lot more threats you know, that the otters face, and that's the smooth coated otter. Uh, primarily, these threats are from um, essentially what are called anthropogenic activities, you know, interactions with people and conflict arising thereon. And maybe we can talk about it as we go forward. Yeah, so you mentioned the dam. So, how much has the dam impacted uh, the, both the species? Because we always heard of this dam and we always hear about the the fights over water between Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Huh? But we hardly hear about a species which is very dependent, which is an indicator species, if you, yes, one might say. So um, how does this, uh, the, the dynamics change with the dam? So this particular dam is now uh, been around for such a long time that there has been absolutely no study that was done before and after. Um, one thing about otters, Ananda, is that they are by and large a very adaptable species. And dams affect them, um, but we don't know to what extent. We know that they are very adaptable. We know that dams, and when I say affect them, I mean directly, right? One thing that we know for sure is that um, many populations of otters actually interact, certainly in the breeding season. And this could definitely be effectively blocking off that interaction. But very interestingly and importantly, the, the prey of the otters, of the smooth coated otter being fish, fish populations have been decimated in the Kaveri. They have been destroyed. And I can't just blame dams for it because there are a series of dams. There's also to do with pollution, which is agriculture pesticides plus you know, sewage and everything else. And this river is sort of receptacle for everything. So the fish populations have been absolutely decimated. And consequently, um, the otters now find that they are in conflict with fishermen much more and vice versa, right? So that conflict is a real serious issue. Um, so to that extent, I think uh, any kind of river modification as they call it, whether it's a dam or whether it's linking or whether even you know sand mining which is a serious issue and that's a kind of river modification you're changing the nature of the river they really affect otters because they affect its prey base so much it's interesting this is another chapter to human wildlife conflict if i can put it in that way yes hmm. but Absolutely. you also have yeah you also have uh, three different projects in that same area or is it in a different state uh, two projects in uh, along the Kaveri, okay, and one project in South Maharashtra. Okay, so just uh, if we just can uh, elaborate a bit on these three projects. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Ananda. So in uh, in Kodugu or Kurg, our primary effort has been to undertake a kind of baseline survey to and and to find out what is happening to the, sm the, the small clawed otter. We've also incidentally worked on the Kerala side of it. In fact, there's a project going on as we speak on the Kerala side, which is 
another beautiful landscape called Vainad. And uh, this entire hill range, part of the Western Ghats, is called the Brahmagiri Hill Range. So our project is called the Brahmagiri Rewilding Project. And we are trying to work with stakeholders to create this kind of restoration rewilding initiative to enable the streams to be protected, the habitat. Primarily, we are looking at habitat. So we are asking questions like, how can we bring back certain iconic fish that are part of those stream ecosystems? What can we do to protect the riparian buffers that actually ensure lesser erosion and protection of the stream? That's our focus in, in Kodugu or Kurg. Downstream, which is downstream of Mysore, we have a project along an auto corridor that we call the H auto corridor. H primarily being the code word for the name of the village. Here, there is a very high pressure on the animal itself, on the species, primarily from fishermen who have two kinds of fishing. There are tr the traditional fishermen who use nets, which are called gill nets. And otters come and pick the fish of the gill nets. And that damages the nets as well as the fish. And then these fishermen want to retaliate by, you know, they, they try to harm the otters either by burning the dens when they have pups, um, which typically happens in winter, or they kill otters if they are able to, if the otters get entangled in nets, or they put snares sometimes for the otters. The other kind of big threat to otters in this landscape, which I'm talking about, the edge of the corridor, is dynamite fishing, where people throw sticks of dynamite into the river. And that kills masses of fish. And very often, the otter will be very nearby. And there are recorded incidents that we have um, of otters being killed as a consequence. In addition to that, it really is decimating the prey base of the otter. In South Maharashtra, to end that little bit you asked, our work was primarily along, again, doing a baseline survey for both species and understanding what are the threats they face. In the process of which we came across a, a Miristika swamp, uh, which is an ancient swamp like uh, a mangrove, except that it's a freshwater ecosystem. And that, you know, after considerable effort, now that has been declared a biodiversity heritage site. Um, so these are the three areas that we have worked in, yes. What's the way forward if I want to ask you? I mean, you've been working for a, quite a long time and you mentioned the, the critical areas, uh, especially with the declining uh, prey base for waters, pollution. So, and how has the Karnataka Forest Department, if I may ask, uh, has done something or hasn't done something on this. Okay, so um, the, the way forward, can I answer that a little later? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. first talk about the Karnataka Forest Department yeah. and so on. So uh, certainly I, I must say that compared to many other forest departments across the country, we are very privileged to have a department here that is very receptive. You know, and uh, there are many officers who actually have done a great deal to stop the poaching, even when the poaching was at its peak in, in the state. So in that sense, I'm extremely grateful, honestly, and I'm not saying this because it's politically correct. I'm saying it because I genuinely feel that. Uh, I also know that they have a very tough job to do with a species like this, because it's really, you know, it's not the species that is in conservation focus, right? And the majority of waters are outside the protected areas. So it's even harder for them to get involved. And whenever we have reached out to the department, we have found them really supportive and helpful. So that is first. The second part is we are the only state in the country. I, I live in Bangalore and obviously uh, that's pretty obvious by now. Um, the, we are the only state in the country where we've actually got a water reserve. We have a conservation reserve along the Tungabhadra and uh, we are the first state we have actually declared that. And we have just submitted a proposal in Maharashtra for a declaration of an auto reserve there. Whether that will happen, I don't know. But, but um, we have been, Karnataka has been proactive on that. Um, having said that, our main stakeholder in this is actually, even though they have, the forest department is very receptive, our main stakeholder is actually the fisheries department. 
and there we have had to start from ground zero we have had to actually educate the officers about this this species because the entire narrative of the department was to promote the fishery side of it and very often because of this conflict they were probably taking the side of the fishers rather than you know uh, the side of wildlife so there the process of education is very incomplete at this moment and that is a much bigger challenge because their stakeholders are not you know uh, people who are wildlife conservationists their stakeholders are really the fishermen uh, and the, the sort of political constituencies behind the fishermen so it's a little more challenging to, to in in that sense i hope i've answered your question on this yes and i also wanted to ask you on a different note we talked about rivers mostly but what about wetlands adjoining rivers what about that habitat um with specific reference to otters or yeah, with, with with reference to otter okay so it's it's a fascinating question ananda and uh, what we find is that uh, you have these sporadic reports that pop up of otters in wetlands uh, let me give you two three classic examples we have a wetland a grassland wetland habitat outside bangalore called hesargata and there is a lone otter that has been spotted there how that came there when did that come there remains a mystery right similarly there is a little town in tamil nadu which is uh, just about 4 hours from 3 hours from where i stay uh, the town is tiruvannamalai and there is a wetland habitat there which has uh, where 2 uh, years ago they spotted an otter uh, and after seeing it regularly for a while that otter disappeared right how does it come there one possible explanation so there are two possible explanations one explanation could be during the monsoonal floods right the, the otter kind of finds its way into inland lakes and wetlands and it stays there because the feed and the 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 prey base is good and then probably finds it too late to come back another occasional answer could be that uh, sometimes these are caught and sold as pets which have has happened with in the past but not not that i know of personally but i have heard about this and then after having this for some time people having the animal for some time people realize that this is not a domestic animal in fact the smooth coated otter has a very nasty bite so then they figure out how to release this and that has happened to so many species isn't it it has happened to leopard cats for example so is that how it finds somebody releases it somewhere is that what happens we still don't have a definitive answer but there are quite a few wetlands where otters have um, made residence or been spotted seasonally yes so is there an effort also a focus on reviving or protecting these wetlands because uh, wetlands um, is one ecosystem which has a uh, kind of faced the brunt of development especially where you stay in bangalore and karnataka hmm and elsewhere in the country so is there a focus from the hmm government side so you know it's really driven by citizens and uh there are you know bangalore has a very by and large a very aware citizen community now this answer is not to do with otters in general but with uh, otters in particular but with wetlands in general uh, in bangalore there has been a very vibrant movement on lakes for instance right um in kerala i know uh, and i am hoping to be part of a movement where they are looking to protect a wetland um where there are otters actually and again the community has come forward right um in hyderabad there have been couple of instances in chennai there has been right so you have these and and tiruvannamalai really was an example of trying to protect this wetland so there are citizen efforts that have often galvanized the government into action very rarely the other way around generally the citizens put up a proposal it goes all the way uh, and then you know you really push the government into doing something sometimes the government comes in and does the wrong thing they bring jcbs and they sort of dig up and excavate stuff when you need a very nuanced and delicate approach to deal with the 
ecosystem, which it's a wetland ecosystem just for viewers is, is an extremely finely balanced, delicate system. The reeds, the reed bed in the wetland system, for example, is extremely important. So you get a JCB in and remove the reed saying these are infestations, you will actually be creating a much bigger problem because they are homes, for example, to insects that host migratory birds. I'm just giving one example. Um, so I, I think Karnataka again, you know, is probably ahead of the curve, certainly when you look at some other parts of India. Right. And, oh. and just to sort of, if I may just complete yeah. that, another place, of course, is, you know, where we are seeing um, not so good things happen is, you know, if you look at Assam, for example, all the focus tends to be on Kaziranga and Manas, but there are so many wetlands like Deepor Bhil, for example, which is such a beautiful wetland uh, where there is so much of pollution and increasing amounts of waste that's going in. So citizens have the biggest role to play. Thank you. And uh, you mentioned restaurants are fine. Any other states or any other parts of the country where you see work on otters, which is of interest? Yes, yes. So, um, in fact, in the last few years, I think they, there have been a few people who have sort of galvanized or catalyzed this. So, uh, a bunch of really nice people in Goa are doing some fine work, right? And... Uh, uh, that, that's a, the, the umbrella, the organization is called Wild Daughters, and they're doing some work with education, conservation, edu conservation awareness as well. Uh, in Chilka Lake, there have been a bunch of people doing some stuff, right? I know that Wildlife Conservation Trust has uh, come across, uh, you know, incidents of otters in their landscape, which is uh, in the central India area. Uh, there's something happening in Assam with committed groups, right? Um, Kerala has got the beginnings of some work that is happening in two, three places. So you are seeing these little bits and, and one of my dreams is to sort of put all of us together and see how we can expand this and make auto conservation something more national. Just to complete that, you know, they're, they're, uh, there's this uh, young girl called Sunita in Sikkim who's done excellent work, for example, in um, looking at otter habitat in up in Sikkim, which is with the with the Eurasian, right? Folks who have done some work on other species sometimes come across otters, right? So there's a very interesting example of uh, people coming across documenting otters while searching for the white-winged wood duck, which is a highly highly endangered species. So there we are. It's fascinating. It's completely fascinating. So coming back to your landscape, the Kaveri and the adjoining areas. So what are the trends that you have noticed? And as I was asking earlier, so what's the roadmap ahead? Oh, yes. Yes. So, uh, you know, I would like to make two points here. The first point is fishermen are the real stakeholders we need to work with because we work outside the protected area. We don't, uh, so my river otter conservancy's mandate is outside PAs. We don't do anything within PAs, right? Uh, primarily because within P, within the protected area as a PA is, uh, you have the forest department as a primary stakeholder. So with fishers, uh, the real agenda has to be to take care of their welfare because they are by and large, as a community, they are in trouble. And that trouble has come out of two, three things. One is obviously post-COVID, most folks doing, you know, having livelihoods like fishing would be in trouble because the marketing channels, et cetera, would be closed. But much before that, it started with the decline in fish populations, both in absolute numbers and in diversity, right? Even within the diversity, um, you have, you have two, three invasive species, even within this reduced diversity, invasive species like tilapia, which have totally taken over. And that has reduced their price, their, so their average incomes. It has reduced certainly the amount of fish that they catch because there are now omnivorous fish that are being introduced, like the African catfish, right? But, uh, but uh, so, sorry, just to interrupt you. Tilapia, I thought it's, um, it's also introduced for for the commercial value so all of these were initially introduced 
for instance in uh, tanks in irrigation tanks and lakes years ago before people really understood the true invasive nature of these species subsequently you know again due to floods and overflows these found their way into rivers and today uh, there are it's a serious issue across india where there are invasive species kaveri is a particularly egregious example and and fish have got you know they're so badly affected that a fisherman who 10 years ago used to comf comfortably in the peak season catch between 10 to 12 kilos in that same season today he would be happy to catch 3 to 4 kilos and if you were to take the equivalent rates you know a a, a fish like maral for example would get 300 rupees a kilo in today's price he hardly finds it but if you were to take tilapia it would be 60 to 80 rupees so that's why it's called the poor man's fish so that's why it was introduced it was introduced yes yes and and the fact of the matter is that it was never intended to be sort of the a livelihood thing for fishermen but it sort of ended up being this way yes it's yeah, so quite a worrying situation yes so so sorry uh, so the way forward is really to find ways to help their livelihoods by giving them a broader base so ensuring that fishing becomes one part of their livelihood but certainly there is a larger denominator that they look for employment opportunities in construction and probably with the government and we have put a proposal up to the government where they could employ these people because they have the equipment whether they could use the same equipment like a coracle or a boat for instance to clean up the river right so could you pay fishermen to go in and bring out plastic from the river and muck from the river when i say muck i'm talking about you know clothing shoes that kind of stuff which finds its way um it's a proposal which is being considered by the government now yeah so one quick last question because we're running out of time so any population trend that you have observed it's over the years that you have been working any survey on population or yeah so uh, the, uh i can talk for our auto corridor uh i would say by and large it has been stable and the reason it has been stable is also because um the i would say there has been some intervention that has helped um number one number two it's also a, uh, the number of fishers the fishermen in our area has been relatively less right so to that extent there has been a reasonably stable population with i would say a 5 to 10% variation year on year yes so i can't comment beyond that because we really have very little data so so this is on the smooth coated otter yes small clot we know nothing nothing i mean the we really are at such a low denominator yeah why is that so if i may ask it's, it's a very hard species to study anand though it's okay. uh, as i mentioned earlier it's nocturnal and crepuscular you have to really study it primarily following its uh, its poop which we call sprint yeah. and looking at sprint density right the only thing we know from a correlation perspective is that wherever they seem to be very heavy pesticide usage um its populations tend to be lesser right again i can't have i don't have cross landscape data to say there's a certain correlation yeah so we don't have data we don't have enough cross landscape data which we need across multiple landscapes to form any kind of opinion on populations thank you gopa so much for this story on otters i know covid has impacted your field work this year yes but i wish for the best in the coming months uh, and more power to you thank you and thank you so much for this opportunity ananda and uh, i would just have to tell everyone watching this uh, learn more about otters online see their videos and it's such a lovely species it's it's a wonderfully charismatic species yes. and uh, thank you to the viewers as well we shall be back with uh, another expert next week thank you stay safe yeah thank you